I'm very grateful for the kind invitation, for the very warm introduction and very generous introduction. Uh, I'm not sure I deserve that. Of course, I have a good background of serving some long years in, in Asia, almost uh, all my career, except uh, for a short stint in, in London. Uh, represented the missions uh, in, in uh, China, Tokyo, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. I would say that uh, I was rather lucky sometime our destiny gives us some chances. And uh, I consider myself lucky also having the chance today to be in front of you, a distinguished audience, and to try to exchange some views about how us as European Union have to deal with a very important region of the world and uh, with an important number of partners who may be crucially important in shaping the future world and maintain and enhance our chances for prosperity and progress. Uh, I was just sharing uh, initially some thoughts about the way in which our department was shaped, one of the leading departments in the structure as it was thought at the beginning of this year number one department, not in orders of the, the numbering process, but also as one which had to inherit a very good agenda from last year. You may recall that Asia loomed large on the agenda of the EU with an important number of summits, with an important number of agreements concluded last year, with an agenda which was very promising. Well, it's still so, while at the same time, you may know better, the flow of the events in the neighbourhood European neighborhood, meaning Eastern Europe, South Eastern Europe, and of course the, the Middle East and Northern Africa produced new developments and the political focus switched for a while. But still, the important trend of seeing Asia as an important region and partner is still there. Then from this point of view, once again, I prepared some facts, figures, our reflections on how we have to shape, develop, enhance, expand the relationship for the EU on behalf of the member states, for the interest of the member states with this region. I have to say, first of all, that uh, after seven months uh, during which I served in, in the service and in Asian department, I feel very proud that this month proved at least two meaningful things. First of all, that the service itself, it's a very successful international executive operation, a structure which is serving very well the external agenda of the Union and the Member States and trying to concentrate the expertise we inherited from various previously existing structures like the Commission, the European Parliament, some of the colleagues are coming from the technical services of the European Parliament and the European Council, and of course from member states, especially in diplomacy, crisis management and development assistance. It's uh, an agenda which covers three meaningful areas and if you look around you'll see how every day, especially in the regions I've mentioned being now in the focus, like the southern neighborhood or eastern neighborhood, these three aspects are very much interlinked and represent good contribution of the service to the way in which the European Union and member states can, can promote their interests. But speaking about Asia, first of all, just to give you an impression of what does it mean for us, uh, it means to deal with 47 countries and four territories, more than two billion people, and with a landscape which combines meaningful, evolving geoeconomics and geopolitical factors. From this point of view, I would say that uh, the landscape may look patchy. Impressive economic growth, new developments in social and political reforms, Worrying trends in terms of regional security, but still not only dark spots, but also bright spots in the way in which the whole region is trying to overcome previously existing, shall I call it, uh, institutional anemia and gradually moving through a concerted joint effort to building 
regional structures, regional mechanisms, which can deal with the emergencies, with the disputes, with the issues of common concern for the, for the states in the region. Then, uh, to a certain extent, we witness a process of integration, which might be meaningful and also which may invite a stronger, more substantial European contribution. Let me go through a several points which may describe to you how our agenda is shaped by past, present and the future. First, I would say that for us already, we have several pillars which are very important and inherited from the past decades. Europe being a main donor for the countries in the region, main trade partner. The latest figures uh, proved that already Asia for the European agenda surpassed NAFTA, becoming the main trading partner. A third of the Europe's total trade flows go to Asia, and one third of the European investments are heading towards Europe, uh, Asian markets. At the same time, Europe stays as the most important source of um, development assistance programs and also programs which help promoting social, political reforms, human rights, eradicating poverty. At the same time, we are trying to have a better grasp on the latest accelerated developments which show that in the global landscape, the power may shift towards East, and Asia, especially certain new protagonists of the international arena, may become stronger, more important partners for Europe in its role of being or enhancing its international role. From this point of view, I would say uh, the framework of Asia-Europe meeting is very important for Europe as a framework in which we succeeded to build up stronger relationships with ASEAN as the main organization in the region and a number of important players like China, Japan and the Republic of Korea. We have a good strategy which we inherited as our department from the Commission. It was always idea that the partnerships with the countries in the region should be built on a sort of a double approach encompassing political areas and economic and trade areas, then we inherited the practice of negotiating and concluding so-called political agreements with the name of partnership and cooperation agreements, very comprehensive agreements, with a lot of provisions, sometimes including political ones, human rights, good governance, and trade or economic-related provisions. And that coupled with free trade agreements. This two-folded approach, it was always shaping a good platform for the EU relations with the country in the region and also generating a good platform, a good framework for the individual EU member states in developing their uh, particular specific relationships with the countries in Asia. From this point of view, I can report to you that this process, which started, of course, during the Commission years by the Commission Specialized Services, and we inherited and we are continuing that together with the Commission, we succeeded already to have five partnership and cooperation agreements with Asian countries, completed in 2009-10 with Indonesia, Korea, Republic of Korea, Mongolia, Philippines, and Vietnam. FAR partnership and cooperation agreements still underway under negotiations with uh, uh, China, which you, you may well uh, imagine that the extension, the amplitude of such a partnership and cooperation agreement with China, which is sort of an upgrading and updating of the 1985 uh, agreement with China, is not a very easy process. And also negotiations ongoing with some other Southeast Asian countries, as I mentioned, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia. And two more, uh, which we expect to launch soon with Brunei and Australia. 
I said about coupling that with uh, trade agreements, so-called free trade agreements, which uh, for a while have been uh, successful as being concluded with excellent results, the biggest FTA for the EU ever, already concluded last year with uh, Republic of Korea, and since July 1st already started implementation, and the previous, let's say, first two months already showing splendid results, more than 30% increase in <coughs> bilateral trade, exports and imports for each side. And uh, a next one looming large, the foreign, uh, the, the free trade agreement with India, which uh, for a while proof, proves to be, given the, the uh, ambitions, let's say, the scope we envisaged for, for such a uh, uh, trade agreement, being not very easy to negotiate, but still the efforts being done at all the levels, from the highest political level, which uh, is supporting and providing the political backup for that, till the technical services of the uh, Commission. The negotiations ongoing, and also with other countries, which are uh, negotiations uh, registering good progress, like with Singapore and Malaysia. And having some other members in the ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asian region, like uh, um, Vietnam, Japan, in, in the Northeast Asia, willing to, to uh, negotiate some, such agreements. Um, I, I was uh, mentioning the experience of the EU in uh, development assistance, and there are two points to make in that respect. While remaining the biggest donor in the region, and Asia, of course, the most important recipient, I would say that we, we by now, are trying to do a sort of adjustments in the planning process for, for the future cycle, taking into account, once again, the uh, economic dynamism of the region, the good uh, victories they scored in many ways, uh, GDP growth, per capita growth, trade flows increasing uh, at a more accelerated speed. And at the same time, given the level of uh, local resources, from this point of view, of course, there are considerations related to the new levels of income at the national level in, the, in these countries. Then maybe uh, the amount of uh, development assistance programmed for the future cycles would not be as much as in the past. And new considerations, of course, are just setting in and we'll do a rethinking about the way in which China, India, maybe Indonesia will benefit in the future in amount or in nature and we will reconsider the way in which we'll proceed with uh, this assistance. But we have to, to, to admit, to recognize that still many countries, including the, those now mentioned as belonging to the mid-level uh, income categories, they still, unfortunately, have problems. I've mentioned China, India, for example. Still, on certain parts of their territories, still have pockets of very serious uh, poverty, uh, challenging their national efforts. And from this point of view, of course, EU will be always ready to provide a certain amount of assistance, assistance in expertise, in the way in which to, to fight against uh, poverty and underdevelopment. And I will have to, to recall that uh, just for the whole Asia, for the period going from 2007 to 2013, we uh, earmarked a total amount of grants from over 5 billion euros from the EU's development cooperation instrument. The same, because I, 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 haven't, uh, I haven't mentioned yet, besides Asia, we are covering also the Pacific, which of course is close to Asia. I, I won't go into uh, discussions on how would be properly defined the whole Asian continent, but we are covering from the borders of Mongolia, China, Northeast Asia, to the borders of Iran. Iran not being included, Central Asia is not included in, in our geographical area. But then Pacific, first time, it was uh, included in, in, in the area we are uh, responsible for. And uh, the 15 countries in the Pacific are also uh, recipients of an important amount of uh, European effort in development assistance, including for the fact that they are challenged 
by the climate change, and many of them are, are very much threatened by the level of rising water. Then uh, let me say after this uh, general, very broad introduction, uh, you, you may be interested in, in certain details about our thinking and strategies in dealing with uh, a certain number of important partners in the region. I've mentioned that we have four strategic partners. And uh, as you may know, since September last year, there is a good debate going on. Uh, by the end of the year in December, also a good number of papers were uh, dedicated uh, in the European Council to the thinking about what the concept of the strategic partners should be actually uh, defined and implemented. Uh, I would say this, this process of reflection, which invites, of course, contribution uh, from the member states, uh, from the parliament as a political guidance, it's still going on. Uh, besides the ones which were discussed last year, the United States, Russia, China, there are many other important strategic partners with new developments in their national and international uh, situation, and that invites uh, a more focused approach, a new way of defining priorities, objectives, way of implementing and promoting stronger uh, expanded relationship with these so-called strategic partners. The case of India, Brazil, South Africa. Then uh, from this point of view, I will start with China, which looms large on our agenda with Asia. Uh, last year, as you may know, we, we had a summit in the fall in Brussels. It was sort of a transitional summit because it came immediately after, as the first summit with China after uh, the adoption of the uh, Lisbon Treaty. Then the new institutions, European institutions, were not exactly all of them already in place. And uh, from this point of view, let me say we did, to a certain extent, better after the, the beginning of this year, while we started to, to look into this uh, strategic partnership we have to chi with China, stated in 2003. And we tried to use as much as we could in this very short lapse of time, the new instruments created by the uh, Lisbon Treaty. And you may recall, in mid-May, we had the first visit abroad of the President of European Council in his capacity. President Van Rompuy went to China in mid-May for a very successful state visit. Um, it was one which uh, has shown that in his position, in his role as a political authority representing the EU, he may contribute very well in a dialogue or at the substance and the extension of the political dialogue with a meaningful strategic partner. Then later on, we had also the second round of strategic dialogue with another institution, if you want, created by the Lisbon. And it was uh, the second round of strategic dialogue done by uh, Lady Ashton, as High Representative and Vice President of the Commission, with uh, State Councillor Taiping Guo. Uh, a high level of, uh, of dialogue too, especially meaningful because it focused on a good range of global and international issues. And without adventuring myself in trying to, to elaborate more on how we see the, the strategic partnership concept, uh, in an, if you want, in an immediate understanding uh, which may guide uh, our actual work in implementing that would be beside the bilateral relationship to go international, to go beyond bilateral at regional and global level, and to go into long term. I would say that to a certain extent we are doing that since, once again, since the beginning of the service in the relations with, with China. And uh, let me say to the same extent the Chinese are willing to join our efforts in exploring such directions for actually implementing what we generously called strategic partnership. Uh, I would say first, because I've mentioned the, the uh, going beyond bilateral, that uh, visibly this year the quality of engagement with China in the multilateral setting improved. And uh, well, we may have some specific examples as China uh, voting together with those who supported the new role of the EU at the United Nations, yeah, as observer. 
But of course, there are still moments in which, following its national interests, China and some other strategic partners of the EU may have a different position, as it's happened recently on the resolution in the Security Council on Syria. At the same time, I have to say, the bright spots, many others are there, noticed in the process of uh, achieving a greater political coordination on other, as I said, global and international issues, like on climate change, uh, counter piracy, uh, Asian security, coordination on, on the issues which are on the agenda of the G20, and so on. I have to, to uh, recall also the way in which, I guess, uh, very much your attention was, was also focusing on the way in which China uh, has a certain role against the background of the uh, European sovereign debt crisis. Uh, Though still uh, the exposure is small, the amount of uh, euro bonds bought by China, it's, it's not very much. But still, in many occasions, uh, through political statements, public statements, political statements, um, its general attitude, including in the media, uh, the Chinese expressed confidence and support in the efforts done to uh, manage the, the euro crisis, and to the same extent, they went ahead in supporting individual member states. Um, from this point of view, I would say that it's good to see such a major global economic player expressing faith into the resilience of the eurozone. Um, at the same time, of course, I have to, to recall the fact that uh, the, the economic, the financial and economic crisis since 2008, as you may have noticed, pushed China upwards and its economic performance suddenly positioned China, as I was saying, as a leading economic player in the world. It became the second big economy, uh, surpassing uh, Japan. And at the same time, the people uh, started to noticed how much the economic potential, not only because of the natural resources, labor resources, the financial resources, the, the amount of uh, foreign currency reserves existing in China, but also the market, still are now challenges and opportunities. From this point of view, I would say that uh, our service and myself, we are increasingly aware of the expertise, knowledge, and good grasp on the realities in Asia in general, in, in, in China in special, existing at the level of the European business community. Since almost three decades already, the European companies, with a fantastic courage and good entrepreneurial spirit, adventured into the Chinese market. They were more or less players contributors and partners into the process of opening and reforming the Chinese society and the economy, invested a lot in terms of bringing in technology, transferring technology, bringing in advanced and efficient, more efficient management, training Chinese experts and managers, being a part of the whole game through which effort and construction through which China became an important economic player. I'm, I'm not sure we all, maybe including the Chinese friends, paid enough tribute to the contribution of the European companies, tens of thousands of European companies who kept being very uh, present, active, and courageous, exploring and courageously exploring the, the European market, uh, the Chinese market, and being a part of this advance and progress of the Chinese economy. From this point of view, once again, I would say the new developments are very much inviting us to join hands with the leaders of the European community. Here in Europe, or uh, those present in Asia in general, or those present on the Chinese markets, to look into the crystal ball and devise better, more efficient strategies in coupling the European and Chinese economy in special, or with the Chinese, Asian economies in general. Because the level of interdependence now in the economic field, as you may say also, is 
unprecedented. And to the same extent, invites to a certain adjustment, upgrading of our business and political strategies and policies. From this point of view, I would say EU developed along the years a good number of sectoral mechanisms for cooperation, dialogue with China, over 50. The problem now is that we have enough, you may say, or too many also mechanisms. And sometimes we disperse important things in smaller way of conducting certain dialogue exchanges. And it would be much better to be more selective and focused. I don't know. It's open to discussion. But what we need, for sure, it's very much to look into priorities of the EU now against the current context, to the priorities of Chinese, and to try to devise better strategies of cooperation. And it happened already, if you want, since uh, the spring, as you may know, during the uh, debates of the National People's Congress, the Chinese Parliament, in March, by the end of March, actually, it was adopted the new five-year uh, plan, sort of a guidelines, macroeconomic <coughs> guidelines for the next five years, starting for 2011. And I would say that to a greater extent that in the past we felt and we invited a good number of think tanks. And I would be happy if your distinguished think tank we may be also involved in such a, an open reflection. How the European 2020 strategy and the, five, the Chinese five years guidelines may well offer a potential. Because there are a lot of commonalities regarding the sustained development, green economy, yeah, urbanization, social development many fields which may, be, <coughs> may represent the potential a new areas for uh, updating, upgrading, refreshing our, our uh, cooperation in many fields. Because of that, once again, I admit and praise the work done for having a good number uh, of sectoral dialogues, but I would very much invite them to live up to the current uh, requirements of exploring new areas more in a more efficient, in a better way, to answer to the European expectations. And I would say our service, the European External Service and our department, is adding very much in this respect, not only working for implementing the, a number of priorities, a number of priorities which were explicitly uh, stated for the service, contributing to the uh, crisis management, uh, developing relations with strategic partners, I mentioned China. Uh, and building the department, of course, that, that might be the first priority, uh, and promoting human rights. But I would add another one. I would beg to, to, to creatively, with your kind acceptance, uh, add another one against the background, uh, the difficult one, which is challenging one, uh, challenging all of us after the crisis, meaning generate additional resources in economy and trade, for contributing to the relaunch of the economic growth in, in Europe. And that can be done in the relations with China and in general with Asia. Of course, I, I've mentioned shortly uh, our contribution to, to the priorities uh, related to the promoting uh, basic values like human rights. Of course, uh, Chinese, they face a lot of challenges after three decades of sustained growth, which tremendously changed the whole landscape, social and political landscape. Maybe not to the extent which was uh, expected in some other parts of the world, but which very much contributed first to integrating China into international community, contributing to a certain amount of, a certain degree of liberalization of that society, to a certain extent of embracing, adopting, localizing international and European values. But the process, it's not finished. Besides, as many events proved, if you want, but you can choose any point in time, but I would be just uh, given my experience on the grounds as Romanian ambassador there to say since 2008 maybe, but because since 2008, 
the level of international exposure of China because of the domestic and international events or uh, events with an international dimension, as it happened to be Beijing Olympic Games last year's Shanghai World Expo, China increasingly had to go international and to welcome a greater extent yeah, of international, if you want, participation into Chinese affairs. Then, from this point of view, I would say we are challenging sometime China, inviting her to be more courageous, daringly promote a greater extent of opening and reforms, and offering in that respect expertise, our experience in many ways, in the way in which Europe, European Union, member states went through transition, changes, and to the same extent, trying to understand the specific situation of China challenged by the new stage of its own development. And I would say from this respect, what I've mentioned, the five years uh, macroeconomic plan, it's uh, offering good openings for us to get more involved in this process of societal transformation, in the process of reshaping the default economic growth pattern of China. As you may know, from the growth driven by exports to the growth driven by consumption. And that would, of course, generate a lot of opportunities for the uh, European exports, for the European uh, industrial cooperation and other kind of uh, companies, services, for example, on the, Europe on the uh, Chinese markets. With the human rights, I have to say that uh, China had, once again, a lot of events which happened and had very much required a proper handling in terms of domestic policies, which very much contributed to a certain thinking on how the Chinese political reform should proceed. Of course, I, I already abuse of your patience speaking so much about China, but once again, that's a process in which I see chances for us to be more present. And I will have to recall with pleasure that uh, I've mentioned the instruments created by the uh, Treaty of Lisbon being useful in promoting our relationship with strategic partners in various ways. And I have to say from this point of view that President Van Rompuy, uh, Lady Ashton as High Representative, in various occasions, as I said, at the highest political level possible, had good talks with Chinese on various issues which included the way in which we see the situation on human rights in China and the way ahead in promoting bilateral dialogue, cooperation, various individual programs of assistance for training lawyer, judges, human rights militants in China and helping China to move ahead in a way which is compatible and may be seen acceptable from our point of view. Then, from this point of view, it's, it's a very complex relationship, I would say, and that's something which we do, especially because we, we want to see China more integrated international uh, society and sharing responsibility as an emerging regional and global power. Um, I, I will try to go ahead with, uh, I will shorten that part about China, but going to India, another strategic partner of the EU, uh, a title given in, in 2005, but it's not only honorary, it's a, a justified, a very legitimate recognition of its new status in at the regional and international level, uh, its rising capacity to contribute in many ways to the resolution of the global challenges. And I would say that, uh, once again, I would kindly invite uh, a stronger, uh, uh, a more visible additional effort from the European business community to pay attention to a market with 1.2 billion consumers, and which had has many uh, sectors in which uh, the European technology and management may well uh, expand the potential and the possibilities for the European businesses to make profits and create, generate good benefits also for uh, the Indian friends. Uh, I would say that the partnership is it's solid underpinned by this economic dimension. I have mentioned the, the negotiation on, on the free trade agreement with, with India. Uh, but I would say that, as in the case with China, we have a very elaborate architecture of various sectoral mechanisms of dialogue, dialogue and, and cooperation, which, again, are, are compressing, uh, for example, human rights. It's the only country with which uh, India has such a uh, dialogue with an international partner. 
and uh, many other sectors. We are trying to expand. We are trying to expand because, uh, as I've mentioned, we really believe India has uh, a good contribution to make in the regional and international security and in other issues of global concern, including climate change, uh, energy security, and, and so on. Uh, from this point of view, uh, I have to add also science and technology and so on. Um, I will go next to Japan, uh, which uh, is, of course, a like-minded country. Uh, last year, we had a very good summit, but again, in mid-May, actually, till now, it's the only summit we had this year, given what I've mentioned, the flow of the events, which to a certain extent shadowed our Asian pr priorities. Then the only summit uh, my department organized for this year, um, it was with Japan in mid-May, by the end of May, sorry. And uh, very much was one which was meant to contribute to the comprehensive upgrading of the relationship. And uh, the leaders, when they met, the former Japanese Prime Minister, the President of the European Council and the Commission, decided to launch a two-folded approach, a scoping exercise, we say, to gauge the level of our ambitions in aiming at having a, a wider, more comprehensive and stronger framework in, in the bilateral engagement. One fold being the political framework, the political which would include wider areas in terms of cooperation at regional level, and we have such cooperations. I will, I will give you some examples about the excellent cooperation we have in Middle East or in Afghanistan, and we would like to have more maybe in the Pacific Ocean. I've mentioned those countries being recipient of important amount of development assistance and expertise. And, of course, on the economic side, where, in a very natural way, the, the European business community is, is waiting for us to see what would be the effect, the benefits, the challenges of having a free trade agreement concluded with, with Japan. I've mentioned the, the regional dimension of our cooperation, and uh, as I was saying, in the Horn of Africa and Afghanistan, in North Africa and Middle East, we would like to expand in civilian uh, EU crisis management missions. Um, we worked excellently in the post-Fukushima context after the earthquake, and we are trying, we already proposed to the Japanese friends to expand cooperation on nuclear safety and security and energy efficiency, disaster preparedness, and management. Some other meaningful uh, partners in the region are Australia and New Zealand, with Australia again to the same extent, like-minded country, a very dynamic relations. Uh, together with New Zealand represent two stable and very close partners in, in the region, and we, we feel that they can punch above their weight and advocate more visibly our shared values and interests with the regional partners in Asia and the Pacific. We are prepared to negotiate a framework agreement uh, between EU and Australia, uh, trying to project a long-term partnership and uh, trying to foresee some joint action in various areas like tackling global challenges, climate change, counter-terrorism, Republic of Korea, another, uh, another strategic partner. We had last year uh, an excellent summit. The conclusion of the free trade agreement, as I was saying, is the biggest for a while with the EU. And uh, we are now in the process of exploring with Republic of Korea the way in which we can open some new areas of cooperation. And we are waiting for next spring the moment in which, in, uh, sometime in March, they will be hosts of the uh, Nuclear Energy Summit. A good opportunity, again, maybe to work not only with Korea, which has good expertise in the nuclear energy field, but also with others in the region, including China, Japan, and some others. Um, North Korea, being in the region, uh, if you'll allow, I will just uh, say a few words. Given the extent of the EU's uh, security and economic interests in peace and stability of that region, Asia in general, and the Pacific. 
uh, Korean Peninsula also is given a certain attention. We are trying to, to keep visible our positive role in supporting the peace process in the region. We are not part of the six-party talks, as you may know, but we believe this is an important mechanism, and we are praising the role of USA, Japan, Republic of Korea, China, in trying to keep this process going with, uh, with North Korea. Uh, in parallel, we, we are trying to have bilaterally a, a policy of critical engagement with North Korea. And we are always sending clear messages of concern regarding uh, the domestic situation, especially the human rights situation. Uh, our concern about what happened in the past, certain provocations towards the South. But at the same time, we provide certain very targeted assistance because we are aware of certain domestic problems they, they have. We try to, to help in food, health, sanitation over the past 15 years. And as you may know, lately, uh, given uh, certain exchange of views and uh, certain uh, documentation we've got from the World Food Programme, we decided to uh, provide on an emergency basis a 10 million uh, euros food assistance for certain vulnerable segments of the population. Afghanistan. I was mentioning the, the uh, crisis management part of our story, which represents an important area, an important field in which EU is gradually developing strong capabilities and expertise. Afghanistan, as you may know, uh, you may have uh, followed the debates in mid-July. We had Foreign Affairs Council, the Ministers for Foreign Affairs of the Member States, adopting conclusions on our policies in Afghanistan. And I would say that was a very strong um, and uh, serious political commitment, which answered very much the expectations of the uh, Afghan people. Um, in, in early August, immediately after the, the, the Council, I went to, to Kabul with uh, Polish Foreign Minister uh, Sikorsky. And uh, in the talks with President Karzai, uh, was visible the level of concern and worries they had that uh, in, in certain point in time the international community will disengage and leave them alone. Then from this point of view, EU uh, had a point to prove. And you may know we have certain operations like in assisting the training of the uh, civilian police over there, which shown that we are very much contributed to the uh, institutional capacity building and to those efforts aiming at keeping the stability uh, public order and promoting civilian reforms. Um, actually, since 2002 already, the EU's programs in, in Afghanistan uh, helped in various institutions, building capacity building at the central and local level, electoral reform, justice, and in many other economic sectors uh, to, to develop the private sector, to develop energy, agriculture, and so on. Of course, uh, we are very much aware that uh, domestic challenges are still very big, and of course, if you'll, uh, if you'll want, I can elaborate on that. Pakistan. We, since last year, I would say, we are following very close, paying good attention to what's going on over there. We know that Pakistan is a country which has a crucial role to play against the international terrorists and for the peace and stability of the region in the immediate neighborhood of, of Afghanistan. We continue to, to reinforce our engagement with Pakistan. Last year, at the summit, it was decided to offer a five-year engagement plan, very comprehensive one, let me say, a good number of pages representing various offers in terms of programs, a good selection of sectors uh, aiming at supporting the civilian government, supporting the institutional capacity building and the administration, and helping uh, the economic development and social uh, development of Pakistan. Uh, in these days, just uh, last week, uh, we had very good talks with uh, Pakistani officials from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on how to shape, how to define the whole package of this uh, five years engagement plan, which shows that uh, the EU is not only concerned about the immediate situation, by trying but a midterm commitment to offer programs in helping the civilian authorities to do their best in promoting good governance, social and political reforms, and relaunch the economic development, and being better equipped to deal with the challenges in the domestic and regional security. 
Southeast Asia. I've mentioned uh, ASEAN, Southeast Asia Association, as being a very important one. It's a population of over 6 million people, young and with rising living standards. It's the fifth largest trading partner of the EU with very dynamic economies, very successful, certain very successful models of transition, of democratic transition, like Indonesia, Philippines. As an organization, we feel that ASEAN has a central role to play in what I've mentioned, overcoming the institutional, organizational anemia of the whole region and playing a role in shaping up a bigger, stronger, meaningful architecture, an institutional uh, architecture at the regional level. Then from this point of view, I would say that lately, in the recent years, uh, visibly ASEAN got some inspiration for the European experience, it, and it's going along with that in its own way. The relations with the EU developed uh, significantly in the last two years. We, we had, uh, with 10 individual members, a good number of bilateral agreements and sectoral cooperation, and with ASEAN as a group. I will just uh, uh, point out the successful, efficient developments through three avenues. First, economy. Of course, the economy, I would say, and the trade exchanges shown, as I pointed out, sort of an unprecedented level of interdependence. Critically important for both EU and ASEAN in this very moment in the aftermath of the financial and economic crisis. Secondly, I would mention in the, the, the integration process, the fact that by 2015, ASEAN wants to create an economic community. That should be seen as an opportunity for the uh, European business. It's a uh, level playing field being created and lucrative market in the future being shaped for the European technology, goods, services. FTA negotiations, because of these prospects, are, are moving ahead. And I mentioned good prospects and progress with Singapore, Malaysia, exploratory exercise of seeing what can do, what's the level of the ambitions with Vietnam and Thailand. I've mentioned development assistance. We are giving, uh, we already uh, started and we, we marked for the cycle, financial cycle from 2007 to 2013, already uh, an important amount, 1.3 billion euros, uh, which are uh, dedicated to, uh, as, uh, as grants for, for many countries, one of the biggest recipients being Vietnam. Um, I would say that uh, that process of integration in ASEAN is it's advancing very well, but we are trying to help them to have institutional uh, mechanisms which are working for that. The Secretariat of ASEAN, for example, is it's deserving more attention. We are trying to contribute in terms of staff training, capacity building with that, and have certain programs for, for them. We are also helping them with uh, having a, a regional human rights body. We have uh, a permanent dialogue with those mechanisms in charge of monitoring and following their, their situation in that respect. Just to, to finalize, I would say that uh, the regional landscape, as I put it, looks patchy with the economic dynamics, with certain tensions in terms of territorial disputes and security developments. But what is important for us, I would say, <clears throat> are this kind of uh, cross-cutting issues. One the positive trend towards democratic consolidation yeah, in the region. You, you may have uh, seen the results of the recent elections in Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia. Uh, others are compelling us uh, on an, I would say, emergency basis to try to address the problems of corruption still existing there and affecting those administrations and countries like in Cambodia and Vietnam. We are monitoring closely the latest uh, recent developments in, in Thailand. There is uh, growing hope in Burma, Myanmar, that the new government, uh, as we are uh, following since, since April, is doing a lot of things and uh, very much uh, looks like genuinely taking a path for reform and uh, engagement with various political factors. Uh, from this point of view, we, are, we gave some encouraging signals. We initiated a political dialogue. We had already a mission headed by the advisor of uh, Lady Ashton, Robert Cooper, and uh, a commissioner, Madame Georgieva, visiting. And we will continue for a while with the humanitarian assistance. 
but we, we will watch uh, the developments in terms of political reform, release of the political prisoners, the uh, extended dialogue with certain political opponents. And from this point of view, I would say, we have to be ready, if needed, to make new gesture in encouraging the government to stay on this uh, course. They engage it already in promoting some changes. Um, I've mentioned security challenges in the region. Terrorist risk of proliferation of uh, world weapons of mass destruction, transnational crime, rising energy demands, and competitions. As you may have seen, down to the southern part of the, the region, over natural resources, maritime piracy, natural disasters, the things which happened in Japan, in Japan challenge very much the preparedness and the me existing mechanism. Then from this point of view, I would say the European expertise and involvement, it might be very much appreciated and invited by these developments. Uh, I've mentioned Pacific being part of, uh, of our agenda, but uh, still, I, I, I hope I did not abuse very much of, of your patience. Then uh, if there are any questions on, on the Pacific chapter of our activity, I would be happy to, to elaborate on that. Once again, uh, Asia and the cooperation with our department are very high on, on the agenda uh, at the level of the President of the European Council, the European Commission, and the High Representative uh, Catherine Ashton. From this point of view, I have to say that personally, I, I benefited of a direct support, political guidance, and personal involvement. Very much ne necessary since, as you may know, the Oriental friends, the friends in Asia and in Pacific, they like very much to, to see a certain level of political representation and dialogue. Then, from this point of view, I assure you, this, this fall may be also a very uh, hot one. We are preparing uh, the summit with China. We are preparing certain visits in the region. Once again, very grateful for, for your attention. I hope I did not abuse of your patience, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to answer to your questions. Thank you. Thank you.